Good evening and welcome to you all. As we have begun this night with worship, let us join together in prayer. God, we are grateful for the majesty of your glory. God, we are grateful for the way in which you came and dwelt among us, died for us, and rose again. Father, we commit this night to you. May it be a night of deep thinking, of awe before your word, of faithful following of your son. And may your blessing be upon your servant, Fleming Rutledge, as she leads us into more faithfully following you. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. My name is Amy Peeler, and I'm an associate professor of New Testament here at Wheaton College. And we are very glad for all of you to be here this evening to hear our guest give her presentation. You'll have a chance to engage with her work as you can send your questions by text throughout the evening. Those will be collected and then at the end of her lecture, I'll have a chance to present those and we'll have a bit of a dialogue together. I know you'll learn a great deal. Do after you text your messages or maybe right now, go ahead and put your phones on silent so that we don't know when you're texting. Well, it is my great privilege to welcome this evening Fleming Rutledge. Now, some of you will know her as a great preacher. She has served as a parish minister in New York and Connecticut, and collections of her arresting sermons on the Old Testament, Paul, and the Christian life have become bestsellers. Some of you will know her as a literary scholar beginning as an English major and using her skills to analyze Tolkien's Middle Earth. Some of you will know her as a trailblazer, one of the first women ordained to the priesthood in the late 1970s. And many of you will know her as an author. You have discovered the wealth of her book, Crucifixion, recognized as Christianity Today's 2017 Book of the Year and praised by formidable theologians of our age. And like myself, you probably can't wait to turn your attention to her 2018 book, Advent. Well, in whatever capacity you know her, or if you're among the very few who don't, by the end of the tonight, you will all know her as a bold proclaimer of the gospel. As a fellow Episcopalian and a fellow minister, and corporately, as followers of Jesus, it is our great honor to welcome you to the 2019 Wheaton Theology Conference. Join me in welcoming the Reverend Fleming Rutledge. That was very elegantly put together <laughs> from one English lover to another. Now maybe we won't be able to hear your cell phones if you're entering that number into them and texting, but I'll see you. <laughs> and that will distract me. So just sort of maybe type in a, a keyword or something. <laughs> <laughs> and write the rest of the question later, maybe. Otherwise, I will seek you out. <laughs> now, I was a little confused about what I was supposed to talk about tonight. I had this great idea about what I was going to talk about tonight. And two weeks ago, I took out my material, having just gotten back from Duke. In fact, I just got back from Duke last week. And I opened up the, sched the schedule of the conference, and I noticed that it was supposed to be about the humanity of God, and that is not what I had been working on. So I have really been focusing <laughs> on this. And the name of it is not the announced name. I was going to write, I had this cutesy title, what was it? How to be a biblical theologian. Yes, you, something like that. Well, that is what this is about. That's what I'm always talking about being a biblical theologian, whether you're a professional academic or not. But in any case, I have now prepared something 
on the subject of this conference. <laughs> well, I appreciate that laugh. That makes me feel a little more relaxed. Um, the subject of this conference is the material life of Jesus, his humanity, if you will. And in this address, I propose to focus on his humanity considered specifically as his body. But I'm a preacher, not a lecturer. I have to have a biblical text. And today, I have, tonight, I have several, as we shall see. To begin with, here are the well-known words from the salutation at the beginning of the first epistle of John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, that life was made manifest, and the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, I'm sure I don't have to remind anyone here that this is the author's deliberate reframing and expansion, not only of Genesis 1, but especially of the first verse of the gospel according to John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. Now, I can't speak for you, but that passage in 1 John, that introductory passage, has always struck me as extraordinary. In this introductory passage, the author gives powerful testimony to the material, fleshly life of Jesus in emphatic, insistent, artfully repeated phrases. It was from the beginning. We have heard it. We have seen it with our eyes. We have touched it with our hands. And it is this enfleshed presence that motivates and confirms John as he declares, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. This is great writing. John says essentially the same thing twice in very similar words, and yet it does not sound annoyingly repetitive. Calvin writes that the apostle heaps together many things in confirmation of the gospel. But there is no redundancy, but a fuller expression for the sake of amplification. Love, Calvin. It's the part about we have touched it with our hands that strikes me particularly in the context of our theme. Isn't it interesting that John says we have touched it instead of we have touched him? The fourth gospel doesn't do that. The fourth gospel says more as we would expect. He was in the beginning with God. Why then does the author of the epistle say it? We have touched it with our hands. It seems to be because John wants to speak very particularly here of Jesus as the word of life. He is the word and the Word is the incarnate Son, the living Word of God which was from the beginning. John has a particular investment in the Word of proclamation. He is an apostle, a divinely appointed messenger of the greatest news the world has ever heard. And we are an apostolic church. Back in the 70s, when I was new to preaching and pastoring, I was somewhat intimidated by older clergy who were trained in the historical critical method and had no particular commitment to the theology of the Word of God. They had a commitment to A, what is it? I've even forgotten, J, E, P, and D. Yeah, that's what they were committed to. <laughs> 
and so was I at first. And this is still true in much of the Western Hemisphere. I read only last month about an African Anglican bishop visiting in North America who was shocked because the clergy that he met did not seem to have a robust faith in the Bible as the word of God. I myself was rescued from this dead end perspective by reading Amos Wilder's book, Early Christian Rhetoric. It has been reprinted. To this day, I can feel the thunderclap. Wilder writes that the preaching of the apostles was a new dynamic in human speech, something that had never been heard before. The proclamation of gospel, of the gospel, Wilder continues, was the power of God effecting what was impossible with human beings. The apostles announced the overthrow of Satan's whole reign and the transformation of the world. The stories of Jesus' healings and exorcisms in the Gospels exhibit the ultimate omnipotence of the grace of God. Thus, Wilder, single-handedly without realizing it, turned me through his book toward the presence of the word of God in Jesus Christ. All of this, all of it is present in the word of power that he gives to all who are called to apostolic ministry. This is the power that is given to the church by the Spirit. We don't deepen our knowledge of Christ by focusing on trying to increase our own spirituality. The Spirit deepens that knowledge as we hear the word in faith. Christ Jesus is his own self, the living word, the second person of the Trinity. God is uniquely the one who communicates himself, first in the written word and conclusively in the incarnate body of Jesus Christ. Christ, in Christ, God reveals himself in his gift of a living and embodied word. The epistle to the Hebrews begins, in many and various ways, God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by, the, by a son. It is the speaking of God to us in an embodied second person that defines the speaking of the prophets and the apostles and in their line of succession, the apostolic church, that is to say, you and me. It is that speaking of God in Jesus Christ which is replenished and renewed by the preaching of the word of God. Now, this unique feature of Christian faith, the doctrine of the living word of God, may be obvious of those of you who are here tonight at Wheaton College. You were raised in or were converted to a tradition in which the theology of the word is held in the highest place but I can assure you it is scarcely known at all in many Protestant circles today. Few are seeking to drink deeply from scripture. Rather, I've observed lately, they are looking for what is being called spirituality. The Dalai Lama once protested, rather charmingly, that he should not be compared to Jesus, who was a great master, now, the Dalai Lama certainly meant well, but with all due respect, Jesus was not and is not a spiritual master, not even a great one, not even greater than all others. He is not a spiritual master at all. He is the word become flesh. 
we should be careful with the word spiritual. The Apostle Paul uses the word spiritual often, but it means something very different from the way it is usually used today. He means the sphere of the work of the Holy Spirit, the third person, which can far more often be located in gritty physical reality, in maximum security prisons, homeless shelters, mental hospitals, refugee camps, found there far more often than in walking around labyrinths. <laughs> if this be polemical, make the most of it. I don't usually get that kind of a laugh. This is a, this is a knowing crowd here. <laughs> it is remarkable how little Paul writes about so-called spiritual practices. He wrote, pray without ceasing. But we are on firmer ground, I believe, to think of Paul's praying on the run, so to speak, in constant, urgent appeal to God, asking for the stamina he would require for his journeys, instead of pausing for spiritual practices which he never mentions. Rather, he writes this way, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in much fear and trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of human beings, but in the power of God. He was writing to the Corinthians who were caught up into a spirituality of signs and wonders, experiences of the divine, you might say. The congregation in Corinth was essentially Gnostic. Bodily life was something they thought was insignificant. In this, they resembled the Hellenistic religions around them. That is why Paul wrote sternly to them about the physical demands. Note, the physical demands of his apostleship. He writes, and he's being a bit sarcastic here, I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death because we have become a spectacle to the world. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you Corinthians are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. To the present hour we hunger and thirst. We apostles are ill-clad and buffeted and homeless. We have become and are now as the refuse of the world the off-scouring of all things. Now that just doesn't sound to me like a man who is constantly thinking about the spiritual dimensions of life. Paul's Corinthian letters are strong correctives of the Gnostic tendencies in the Corinthian congregation. They were the original spiritualized church. They thought that having become Christians, they had left their bodies behind, so to speak, as of no importance. Curiously, the Corinthians seem to have carried their Gnostic disdain for the body in two opposite directions. Either on one hand, they withdrew from sexual relations altogether, even in marriage, or they played fast and loose with their bodies, to which Paul directed his famous teaching the body is not made for immorality, but for the Lord. To these opposing errors in the Corinthian congregation, Paul directs his summary teaching about the body that is truly distinguishing. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? So, Glorify God in your body. The true glory of the human body 
derives from the human body of Jesus Christ himself and from his identification with us. Here is the heart of the matter. Just as in the Old Testament, the various post-Eden characters are often famously lusty, pugilistic, intemperate, violent. Yet for all that, they are recognizable human beings living actual bodily lives, not mythical lives, but bodily lives, all in the sight of an unsurprised God who is ever present to them in his address to them. His word to them is usually unexpected, destabilizing, unnerving, but ever restorative and very much addressed to them bodily. Gird up your loins like a man, God says to Job. I will question you, and you will question me. Or rather, I read that wrong. I will question you, and you will declare to me, or answer to me. Now, this is the unique voice of God in our scriptures, reinvesting the suffering Job with dignity equal to that of God himself. That, I think, is the secret to the great theophany at the end of the book of Job. I think it is not completely out of bounds to say that in the great theophany, Job is called to meet with God man to man. Such is the meaning of being made in the image of God. So the material existence of the sun is also the living freshness of the word of God and all its renewing power every day. There's a lovely moment in Marilyn Robinson's Gilead when the preacher and his son are on their journey to find the grave of the grandfather. They stop at a house along the way. We offered to do some chores in exchange for goods, the old preacher writes. The householder did not ask for any chores to be done. He asked the travelers, he asked the pastor, the old pastor, if he would just open a bit of scripture. How surpassingly wonderful that is. Nowadays in the church circles I frequent, no one ever says, says anything like that. <laughs> Back east in the beleaguered mainline churches, we hear so much about develop our, uh, developing our own inner lives, but so little about the living word. I would be deeply thankful tonight if I could open just a little bit of scripture. This is the vocation of the apostolic messenger in every age of the world in which we labor. My word shall never return to me empty, says the Lord. It shall accomplish that which I purpose and prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So, let us now attend further to the gospel declaration concerning the human body of Christ as we read it in Hebrews. Speaking of the temple sacrifices, the author writes that the sacrifices of the temple are ineffective for removing sin. He declares briskly, it is impossible that the, bull, that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. And so, the writer of Hebrews continues. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, and he's quoting here from Psalm 40, he said, sacrifices and offerings thou hast not desired, but a body thou hast prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, thou hast taken no pleasure. Then I said, Lo, I have come to do thy will, O God, as it is written of me in the roll of the book. And by that will, the author continues, 
By that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. What a remarkable imagination the author of Hebrews had. Jesus is depicted as saying the words of the psalmist as though they were his own. And indeed, this is one of the ways of understanding the psalms as Jesus' own voice, his own prayers. In any case, it's the emphasis on the body of Jesus, his material human flesh, that strikes us so often in Hebrews. Jesus is depicted in this passage from the Psalms and its, its enlargement as joined in one will with the Father who has prepared a body for him. Behold, he says, I am here to do your will as it is already written of me. Jesus' greatest desire is to do the will of the Father. There is no seam between them. The will of the Father and the Son are one will. Should there be any doubt, the author writes, and by that one will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And what happens to that body of God? After 33 years of living, after walking many miles a day over rough terrain to fulfill his mission, that body, the body of the Son of God, is publicly condemned, reviled, spat upon, scourged, tormented, fully, or publicly exhibited, nailed, mocked, and made to die at excruciating length upon a wooden crossbar in front of the whole population. That is what happened to the material flesh of Jesus, to the body prepared for him by the will of the three-personed God. I urge every person in this space who has not already read The Cross and the Lynching Tree by James H. Cohn to do so as soon as possible. I am profoundly regretful that I did not know of this arresting work in the 20 years that I spent writing my own book, The Crucifixion. The connection that Cohn makes between crucifixion as a method of dehumanizing and killing a person and the practice of lynching black Americans should be of great importance to American Christianity. It is also crucial to understanding the dialectic of despair and hope, of doubt and faith, that is so characteristic of the African American church. A significant number of white Christians, including myself, have spoken out recently about the continuing miracle of the black church. How else could black Americans tolerate their former slave masters, let alone forgive us except for their depth of the identification, the identification of the black church with the body of Jesus Christ. Cohn writes, the cross was the foundation on which their faith was built. The suffering of Jesus in his body made the difference to black Christians. The complete total, unreserved giving of God's self in the body of Jesus was sufficient to encompass the world of humiliation that black people must endure and overcome on a daily basis. Cohn writes, the spirituals were the soul of the civil rights movement and the church was its anchor. He quotes many of the African American spirituals Poor little Jesus boy, made him to be born in a manger. World treated him so mean, treats me mean too. 
They whooped him up and they whooped him down. They whooped that man all over town. Look how they done my Lord. Physical suffering is not all that Jesus endured. We should take note of the suffering of shame, humiliation, and rejection that were deliberately designed to be part of the whole ritual of crucifixion. This also resonates with everyone who has been outlooked, I mean, who has been outcast or derelict in some way. Hebrews, again, is the book that points out the, rule, the role of shame in the story of Jesus' offering of his body. Note that the shame Jesus endured is the source of strength for us as we face the painful experiences of our own lives. Hebrews again, let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Now, speaking of painful experiences, I've been thinking of what I've been noting and reading about as a shift in our culture. People today don't spend as much money on clothes and furniture and things as they used to, I understand. I read a lot about retail. I think it's interesting. People spend more money now on restaurants and travel. They want experiences. Nothing wrong with that. I'm all for experiences myself. But most people in this world do not have the luxury of experiences. They are fortunate if they have something to eat, a chair to sit on, a table to put their plate on, if they have a plate. I read about the migrant children sleeping under a bridge in El Paso without even a mat to put between themselves and the bare dirt. Think of how shameful that is to have nothing and to have other people stare at you, at your barely clothed body and your outcast condition as though you were not really part of humankind. That is what happened to a crucified person. While I was writing this, I began to notice even more than usual that there is particular suffering that people endure in their bodies. In the past two days, three days, I read of two stories about people who were suffering in their bodies. The latest whistleblower in the White House has made herself known. She's a woman named Tricia Newbold. She's a skilled security professional who has worked at the White House for 18 years. She went to the Congressional Oversight Committee two days ago to tell them what she knew about security clearances that were being given over the protests of a number of security experts. Her boss became suspicious and began to humiliate her in various ways. For one thing, she was removed from her supervisory role. More to the point, however, Ms. Newbold has dwarfism. She is exceedingly short of stature. Her boss maliciously sought to shame her by moving her file boxes to high shelves where she couldn't reach them. She told the House Committee that it was humiliating. She was being attacked in her body. A second article just a few days ago was an obituary for a remarkable woman. Her name was Tejshri Thapa, and she died at only 52 years of age. She was born in Nepal to Nepalese parents, both of them prominent public servants. When she was a teenager, her father was named ambassador to the United States, and her family moved to Washington. 
She graduated from the National Cathedral School. She went on to Wellesley and Cornell, but instead of following the usual pedigreed track to a high-profile law firm, Ms. Thapa went on to work on human rights and violation, violence against women. Her entire career was devoted to exposing and prosecuting mass rape and sexual enslavement. There was not much established legal doctrine in these areas. A director of Human Rights Watch explained that Ms. Thapa's work helped to win several cases involving mass rape and enslavement of, Mus of Muslim women during the Balkan Wars in the 1990s. He said it was her work with victims that helped this happen. Now we're getting close to the point. For many years in the field, Ms. Thapa interviewed hundreds of women, hundreds of women who had been bodily invaded in the most dreadful way. That is what rape is, invasion of the human body. She earned the women's trust, she recorded their testimony in detail, and she stood by them in court. And here is the point. In the case of these women who had suffered extreme torment in their bodies, she stayed in touch with many of them long after she had finished her work for the courts. She gave them her phone number. Here is what the South Asian Director for Human Rights Watch said. She handled the survivors with so much empathy. At some point, most people in her position walk away. She never walked away. Now, both of these women suffered in a particular fashion. Ms. Newbold was created, treated cruelly by her boss, partly because of her gender, no doubt, but principally because of her dwarfism. She soldiered on in that small body, returning to work and saying to the House Committee, as little as I am, I'm willing to fight and stand up for what I know is right. And Tej Tharpa, well, I think most of us would not be able to listen to even a few testimonies like those she heard. People who have heard such accounts say that they felt damaged afterwards. But Ms. Thapa gave them her phone number and did not walk away. These are just two recent examples. We could give hundreds more. PTSD is not precisely a bodily ailment, but it has physical effects, and the soldier who suffers from it feels shame, humiliation, ostracism. My friend Jason Michelli of the famous uh, podcast called Crackers and Grape Juice, he lives with the specter of incurable cancer, and he has written a book called Cancer is funny. It is the kind of laugh to hide your breaking heart book that only a man can write who is undergoing the most drastic kind of chemo. He is merciless in describing the bodily shame that is an inevitable result of the treatment. We went to see the Hotel Mumbai movie last month, last week. It's really just another suspense thriller, a very good one. It is not a work of great, profound, philosophical artistry. However, there's a scene in it that I want to emphasize. It tells the story of the three-day siege of the famous Hotel Taj in Mumbai several years ago. You may remember, a group of young Muslim terrorists held the inhabitants of the hotel and the entire staff prisoner for three days within the hotel, and then they burned it down. As the terrified people staying at the hotel cluster together in a safe room, 
A rich, older white woman display, displays destabilizing fear of a young staff member who wears a turban. She thinks he is one of the terrorists. This is the movie, not the real life. She, this fear begins to spread to the others, putting them all in peril. The young staff man goes to her and shows her photos on his cell phone, photos of his little son and pregnant wife. The white woman begins to calm down. Then he explains to her softly and patiently that he wears the turban because he is a Sikh, that the turban is sacred to a Sikh, and that he never takes it off except in private. He says it would be shameful to take it off. But now here is the remarkable part. He says to her, this terrified woman, he says, if you want me to, I will take it off. She backs down and he keeps the turban on. Later, however, as the group attempts to escape, more and more people are shot and killed, and in the midst of the carnage, we see this young Sikh wordlessly and without display calling no attention to himself, takes off the turban so that he can use the fabric to make a bandage. He did not despise the shame. I read an interview with the young actor Dev Patel, who plays the part of the Sikh. In the original script, his role is not that of a Sikh. He persuaded the filmmakers to change it. He wanted to play a Sikh particularly, he said, because after 9-11, many Sikhs were personally attacked because people thought they were terrorists. And he, the actor, wanted to seize the opportunity to give them support, to take their part, to humanize them. Not an artistic decision, perhaps, but a profoundly humane one to identify with those who are shamed. Now, at this point, I stop to summarize and to bear witness. I said earlier that the original apostles, including especially John, Paul, and the Epistle to the Hebrews author, made a point of Jesus' bodily existence and the really quite extraordinary doctrine of the incarnation of the Word of God. These affirmations are unique to Christianity. As much as we do want to be respectful of other faiths and defend them when they are persecuted, at the same time, we cannot betray our own faith. There is no story like that of the Bible, the story of God who takes on the burden of the whole of humanity in his own material flesh, sharing in our bodily condition at the point of our greatest vulnerability. Karl Barth famously insisted that there could be no discussion of the humanity of God apart from Christology. He writes, it is when we look at Jesus Christ that we know decisively that God's deity does not exclude but include his humanity. I affirmed earlier with the historic creeds that the church is an apostolic church as I look out at you, knowing a little something about the composition of this particular audience, I beseech you always, you always, to remember your commission given you by the Lord of the church, the word of God made flesh. There's a saying attributed to St. Francis of Assisi Preach the gospel if necessary. No, I got it wrong, excuse me. You've heard this. <laughs> Preach the gospel if necessary.
preach the gospel. If necessary, use words. Now, Francis never said that, you know. <laughs> but I hear it quoted constantly as a way of dismissing the vocation of preaching. This reinforces the ignorance of the church when it does not believe in the doctrine of the word of God. Now, we mustn't be self-righteous about this, though. <laughs> but these ideas rob us of the inexhaustible riches of the scriptures. This saying throws us back on our own resources, and that is the worst possible place to be. I can tell you that as a preacher. It is the speaking of God to us in an embodied second person that defines the speaking of the prophets and the apostles, and it defines our vocation as the inheritors of the apostles in the apostolic church. It is the vocation of every Christian to love the word of God and to believe in its power to create something ex nihilo, out of nothing. For as Paul wrote concerning Abraham, Abraham the father of believers, Abraham never ceased to trust in the God who raised the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Let me tell you, yesterday, I thought, I have nothing left in me to give this talk. This has happened to me a thousand times. I throw myself upon the mercy of the God who has given me my apostolic vacation, vocation. There's not anything but a vacation. <laughs> Left to my own resources, I would have played it a long time ago. But is that, it is this God, this God who raises the dead and calls into being the things that do not exist. That God is the God who gave up his very self to endure every gruesome bodily detail of suffering, shameful human existence. It is he who gives us our apostolic vacation. Vo I keep doing it. <laughs> what am I to make of that? Here I am at the cl climax of my speech, and I'm giving, making two mistakes. <laughs> Freudian slip. I want to be on a vacation? No, I don't. I don't want to be on a vacation. I want to be right here, right this minute, with you, because you are going to be preachers of one kind or another, with or without words. <laughs> <laughs> because you are here because you have an apostolic vocation. I guess we'll have to give up on that, I would. You have an apostolic vocation, vocari to call. You cannot have a call unless someone calls you. That is what the word vocation means. An apostolic vocation means that you have been called by the one who called the apostles, that is, by Jesus Christ himself, as the word of God, of which you are the servants. So, he has walked with us. He has not walked away. He has walked with us to the bitter end, even into hell itself. So, glorify God in your body. There is only one true way to perform this, and that is by looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, the only Son of God who said, Sacrifices and offerings thou hast not desired, but a body hast thou prepared for me. Lo, I have come to do thy will, O God. And the apostolic author 
concludes, as do I. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Let us pray. O Word of God incarnate, Lord Jesus Christ, send your Holy Spirit to be a wind and a flame in this room, in the hearts of these your servants, each with a vocation from you. Give them insight to discern that vocation. Strength to perform it and love for all whom you call. In the blessed name, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. How does your view of the Word of God ex affect your personal life with God and your role as a preacher? Now, those are huge questions. If I were going to talk about each one of those things, it would take me, you know, five or ten minutes for each one. Um, I think I've already spoken about how the Word of God affects my personal life because, well, and as a preacher too, because I just come to the end of my rope several times a week. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I really am not kidding. I, uh, I'm uh, not young, and my husband is not young, and we are looking at what the future might hold. And um, I really don't like traveling, don't like getting on airplanes, don't like writing sermons anymore. I used to like it. I don't like it anymore. I find it more difficult now, much more difficult. Um, I particularly find it difficult to write speeches. <laughs> Uh, but um, what you see, I just, I trust, I trust the Bible, I trust the message of the Bible, I trust what the Bible is written, I, I, I trust the person, the three-person God to whom the Bible is a witness. And I have been upheld, as I'm sure many of you have and are being held, by the witness of others and the strength of others. That's part of what goes on in the community of God's people. That's what goes on in the body of Christ. The members turn to one another for encouragement, for strength, for wisdom, for guidance. And that's one of the reasons I am so glad to visit in a residential place where people are studying together uh, every day as bodies in the same place. It's not the same thing we were talking about this afternoon about how study online simply is not, does not have the life of study in a residential setting. So um, I admit to being a kind of word person. I came from a very literary, very verbal family, very articulate family. That helps. But I was also talking to somebody this afternoon about John Bunyan, the Pilgrim's Progress. And there are passages in the Pilgrim's Progress that could be understood by an illiterate person. And John Bunyan has famously wrote in plain speech and comparing the way that John Bunyan wrote to the theologians of the time is really 
head snapping uh, the difference. My point here is that John Bunyan unusually shows how the word itself, the verses of scripture, the messages of scripture, the very words themselves animate the human struggle. And um, so the old uh, pastor who was asked to open up a bit of scripture was doing something that many unlearned people were able to do. I'm not answering this question. Um, <laughs> but it's very good what you're sharing with us. Here's a question. Oh, there's another question at the beginning. No, there isn't. Never mind. Um, what would you say the Christian is primarily called to do? Well, again, I think the Christian is primarily called to bear witness to the Lord who gave himself up for every human being, and indeed for the cosmos, for the created cosmos, for the, the let's just say, the earth and all the stars and the heavens, and but, but it's all inhabited by demonic powers, and I'm getting off the subject. As soon as I get started on the demonic powers, you better shut me up, because I'll go. Um, <laughs> the Christian is primarily called to be a witness, to be a window through which the word of God embodied can meet another person. But it takes shape in each person's life, and I do think, um, the, I think doing what you love is an important part of your vocation. If you are given a gift that you enjoy exercising, then that's your vocation, part of it anyway, a major part of it. If you love um, writing sentences, Annie Dillard said that. Somebody asked her, how could they be a writer? And she said, do you like sentences? If you like sentences, maybe you can be a writer. Maybe that's your vocation. My electrician came over the other day, and I got to talking with him. And he said, I love what I do. I love being an electrician. I love the currents. I love the, te the, the technique. I love understanding it. I love fixing it. And he lamented the fact that not very many young men are going, or women either, are going into electricians training anymore, which is a big crisis. He said it was really a crisis. So um, loving what you do, um, clearly he had a vocation. And I congratulated him on that. I told him, you are really blessed because you have a real vocation and you love it. I met a woman flying out here. I met a woman in the airport who was uh, it's a black woman with this exuberant personality. And I was very depressed and upset. I always am when I'm in an airport. And, um, <laughs> and she was so delightful and, and just made me happy just checking me in. And I complimented her. And she said, I love my job. And um, we chatted a little bit about that. And she said, I can hardly wait to come and work in the morning. And um, I said, well, you're very blessed because you have a vocation. She knew exactly what I was talking about the black church at work. Um, so, let, oh gosh, let's see. Here's a whole bunch of other questions. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to be able to say much about this. How does the incarnation being born through a woman impact how we think about the body of Jesus? Um, Professor um, George uh, hi. Professor George talked about that this afternoon. Actually, maybe he's not here, but anyway. He talked about this afternoon, uh, talked about birth, the actual process of birth. I admit I haven't given much thought about that. Um, That's fine. And you're welcome to choose of any of these questions, or you can pass by them. So there's lots to choose from here. All right, well, sure I just was trying to think if I wanted to say any more about that. Um, 
I have thought about the fact that being born in those circumstances was just so, you, you just could hardly be more lowly than those circumstances. And the whole idea of Jesus being a refugee when they went to Egypt, that's important, I think. That's an important part of what it is to be human, to be driven out of your home, to, to go out into the world and unprotected and in danger and with no clear shelter to go to. That's part of what it is to be human. Um, the, the, the vulnerability of an infant, especially in that day and time, good Lord. I mean, it just boggles the mind. The body of Jesus. Um, Here's someone who's asking about how I have written and focused attention on the shame of the cross. How does, our, how does the resurrection impact our proclamation of the word? Um, let's be really clear about this. If it weren't for the resurrection, we never would have heard of Jesus. I've never been, I keep waiting for somebody to correct that or criticize that. I know one ever does. I don't know. I don't think we would ever have heard of him. Crucified person was a nothing. They were thrown away and their histories were forgotten. We don't know any of the names of anybody who was crucified before Jesus. The crucifixion and the resurrection can't be separated. They are one thing. Um, the question, in a sense, uh, doesn't even compute entirely because The resurrection is the resurrection of a crucified person with the nail still printed. Even in the book of Revelation, the Lamb of God is still standing as it had been slain. Or, depending on the translation, let me see, forever slain, something like that. I've read a lot of different translations. That interests me, the idea that Jesus in heaven, in the kingdom of God, the celestial city, is forever slain. So I just really emphasize how important it is to remember that you can't have the resurrection without the crucifixion, and you wouldn't know about the crucifixion if it hadn't been for the resurrection. Some people really do try to have one without the other. And there was a very good article in Christianity Today this week about this subject. And if you're interested in it, you can either look it up. Uh, I don't remember the name of the author, but you can look at my Twitter account. <laughs> and you will find a snapshot of a page from that excellent article about the cross and the resurrection and how they are twinned, how they go. You can't have one without the other. Okay, I've said enough about that. Let's see, I lost it. Would you find it for me again? Thank you. This is actually a very good way for me to do questions because my hearing is very poor. And it wastes time for me to have to ask people to re repeat the question. How would you describe a properly Christian spirituality? Well, In all seriousness, the word spirituality was not a word that anyone ever used until about 20, 40 years ago, about 40 years ago. I don't really even know where it came from. It's been very interesting to hear black Christians using it all of a sudden, as if they feel as if they have to use this new word. They already had enough spirituality for 25 different kinds of churches because they had, have, love, preach, adored listening to the word preached. Um, the word preached, the word listened to, the word internalized. Bill Stringfellow had this, wrote something, I've forgotten where it is, it's in one of his books, but it was um, put on the cover of a magazine now defunct, and I took, cut off the cover and framed it and put it in my office. It says, essentially, do the word, live the word, read the word, preach the word. It's, it's just the word, 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 word of God. It's better than that. I, uh, maybe I'll put that on my tweet because, um, Twitter account, because I would love for 
people to see that. I think I'll do that. Um, Bill St William Stringfellow was an exceptional, he was kind of loopy, but he was really a very odd person, and a lot of what he says, I think, is not particularly helpful, but he was the real, th <laughs> but he was the real thing. He, when, did I say something that I didn't realize I was saying? Um, you'll have to tell me afterwards. Um, <laughs> When Karl Barth was in America, he didn't want to come to America, and he, I think, was glad to leave. But he said later <laughs> that um, he said later that the person who caught his attention more than anyone else was William Stringfellow. Pretty interesting. And I can, I've, I'm a sort of student of Stringfellow, and I can certainly see what Barth meant. Barth also said, I think this is not apocryphal, that he was not really very interested in coming to the United States. Americans don't, Americans believe in the freedom of the will. Oh, that didn't get a laugh. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, are you all Armenians and Pelagians here? <laughs> yes. I didn't think so. I would describe a properly Christian um, spirituality. I'd rather not use that word, really, but I, well, I would describe going to Pilgrim's Progress and taking a look at that. I would, I would recommend reading Walter Scott's. Nobody reads Sir Walter Scott's books anymore. I do, because I think they're terrific. But... Um, most people don't, but his so supposed masterpiece is called um, the the Heart of Midlothian, and it is it, the characters in it are Scots Presbyterians, and the way they talk, just it flows out of them. It's the way they talk all day, every day. They talk as if they were characters in the Bible. And it's deeply moving to me. Scott didn't have any use for the Presbyterian Church, but he certainly did understand how to depict their piety. And my grandmother was a little bit like that. She read to me. Have I already said this? I don't think so. I must have written it down, though. It's very much in my mind at the moment. My grandmother read the King James, oh no, I know it's because I'm gonna talk about it tomorrow at chapel. My grandmother read me the King James Psalms when I was three, four, five. And that's where my faith comes from. My faith and my shaping and my formation. Not from anything that I do in the way of spiritual exercises. I, it's just this intimate connection between me and my grandmother and the Psalms. That to me is the highest of all forms of Christian formation. That's beautiful, thank you. Could you name some theologians and preachers who have influenced you? Um, well, I can name so very, very, very many. Let me just pick one in particular. I recommend most strongly to you Leslie Newbegin. Leslie Newbegin is amazing because he was writing like a postmodern before anyone else was, except maybe Bart. And I don't know how influenced he was by Bart. Leslie Newbegin is amazing. And he is endlessly enriching and rewarding, I find. Every time I turn back to anything he's written, I am built up all over again. Um, preachers who have influenced me, well, the, the book, this book, Amos Wilder, was the main thing. Um, early Christian rhetoric. I really had to make my own way learning how to preach. Maybe everybody does. I'm not sure I, that anyone interests me. Just, just literature, I think, in general, maybe. and and. Uh, the fact that I did come from a highly literate family was a big help, but um, let me say this. The only time I've ever taught preaching uh, 
professionally, so to speak, was two, I taught for a semester at Wycliffe in Toronto. And I had two classes, 30 students, 15 in each, and for three months each. And I discovered something that I hadn't expected. I discovered that I had to spend a tremendous amount of time working just on their delivery. And I think the preachers that have influenced me, actually, now that I think about it, are the ones who conveyed power and authority in their delivery. It does disappoint me when preachers get up and they are hesitant, timid, or you get the feeling that they're not sure that what they're saying is really worth your listening to, or they back away from the message itself and start telling stories about their children or uh, repeating something they've learned from a preaching aid. You can always tell when people are doing that. Some lectionary aid that they've gotten online. It has to be authentic. It has to be from your gut. And when you're a pastor in a church with the same congregation all the time, you can't fake that. Preaching the way I preach now is not really preaching. Real preaching is preaching Sunday after Sunday after Sunday to the same congregation. That's real preaching. Greg Schreck, are you here? Raise your hand if you are. You told me you were here. Oh, there he, where is he? Okay, there he is. He's, gosh, a white beard. I wouldn't have recognized him. <laughs> Haven't seen him for 30 years. Greg Schreck and I were in the same church at the same time, Grace Church in New York City. Now, this is not directly related to this question, but it is in a way. The reason the preaching was remarkable during the years that I was there, there were five clergy at one time, and the reason the preaching mostly was remarkable was that the congregation expected it to be. Very young people, mostly young people in New York City, and they came expecting to hear something big, something moving, something with power. And they were 20, 25 minute sermons too, which is very unusual in an Episcopal church. So I learned and have never forgotten the importance of the exchange that's going on between the preacher and the congregation. The congregation is participating almost like actors but God, it is said, God is the audience. I don't know whether that's quite right or not. I've heard that said. But God certainly delights in the, in the exchange that goes on in the sermon between the preacher and the congregation. And it, when it's really happening, the word itself takes flesh, so to speak, in the hearing. The word escapes from the preacher. This is what you want. You pray and hope that the word will escape from the preacher into the hearts and souls and minds of the congregation. Because it's not you, it's the word. It's hard to do that when you don't know who you're preaching to. It's much more likely, I think, to happen when you're preaching to a congregation you know. I'm shaking my trying to shake my watch down. What time is it? Almost well, I'm, I'll take one or two more. Let's see. What would you say to a young woman discerning a call to a pastorate? That's something very personal. I don't think I can say that to a group particularly because it all depends on... I would want to ask... Um, what, what, what do you love? What is it you love about the idea of being a pastor? This person may be on the wrong track. Some, sometimes people give reasons for thinking that they are called to being a pastor and the reasons are off the map. Um, I think talking to someone one-on-one -on -one about that is very important. I do know one thing. If you get hung up on being a woman, I don't think you'll be very effective. That's my opinion. I try not to think about it very much. I try to just do the job. Seriously, even when I was one of the first.
In what way do you see God's address to us in Jesus overcoming shame in addition to Jesus' identification with us? That's a hard question because um, it's very important, though, because if we just say, oh, well, Jesus identified with you, so you shouldn't feel so bad, um, that's not very powerful. I think there really has to be a sense that Jesus has almost taken your body into himself. But I've known plenty of people who were not able to receive the love that people tried to give them. Maybe the love was misdirected. Maybe people didn't understand the per this person's shame well enough. I think it's very important to, to try to be with people who will help you. Um, there are people who don't understand or try to understand. And being with them drags you down. So um, seeking out people that understand something about shame and how you need to be supported in your struggle to get out of it would be a very important dimension of of overcoming the feelings of shame. But that's a tough question. I'm not sure that I can do justice to it in a short space. I, I just, I don't think it's enough to just say, oh, Jesus identifies with you in your shame. That's not enough. There has to be much more of a deep engagement with somebody who will help you uh, to overcome feelings of shame. And many people are too ashamed to seek out that kind of deep help. It's one of the reasons I think a lot of people don't go to therapy. But there is help available if you can find someone. It doesn't have to be a therapist, but someone who will really identify what it is that has bothered you so much, that cripples you, that keeps you from functioning as well as you, as well as God wants you to. There are several These are really more, good questions, but, but most of them require lots of time absolutely. to answer. And you've already given us so much. Uh, truly, thank you for your willingness to come, your passion to proclaim the word. Well, I did come just because it's Wheaton. I am really, I'm cutting down on my um, travels, but I just couldn't resist coming to Wheaton. I have a lot of respect for what I know of Wheaton, and I was glad to be able to be among you. Can you join me in giving the thanks? Thank you so much. Thank you.